think you would have heard some of the more uh, experienced attorneys in the room that know me after Pam says professionalism say, what? <laughs> no, you can't be teaching professionalism. Um, but that, that's ultimately the subject uh, that they had me teaching today. Some of the folks that have known me, I've been up here for 15 years, some of the folks that know me will tell you, he's an absolute perfect person to teach professionalism. And then the other 99% will say, absolutely not. There's no way uh, that he would teach professionalism. When we start talking about who's right, I can tell you that both groups are correct. Because professionalism is actually, in my mind, two separate things. And, and I've included some material on the disc for you. The, the first part of professionalism is a certain personal conscientiousness, personal initiative. I'm working to get better every year, every month, every week. I want to be better this week than I was last week. Uh, and that encompasses who I am when we start talking about professionalism. That's the definition that retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor provides us uh, when she says the essence of professionalism is a commitment to develop one's skill to the fullest and to apply that responsibility to the problems at hand. That's what we're talking about when we talk about one type of professionalism. Then we have another type of professionalism where people talk about a certain amount of social, cultural interaction professionalism. And that's where I probably get an F. That's where, that's where when you're dealing with a, an attorney, you're dealing with a client, and they're peeing on you, and they're calling it seven up, and you actually turn to them and say, no, it's piss. I'm offended. You're very unprofessional. Well, that, that's, that is what it is. In that context, I have always believed that professionalism and candor really do not work together. Um, and so what we're going to talk about this morning when we talk about professionalism is, is it, to the extent that it can be defined, is it stable? And second, is it, is it, is it culturally driven? Is it driven by cultural influences? I'm going to start with a story because this is how I've always looked at professionalism. In 86, I was working in New York City as an assistant shipping clerk, uh, which is a glorified messenger assistant shipping clerk for a small Japanese printing house. And they sent me up to Canal Street to pick up, either pick up some business cards or drop off something else. This was all before computers, 1986. And I go up to Canal Street to a place called Copy Photo. I don't even know if it's still in business. And Copy Photo has a sign, and I'm staring at the sign, and the sign is just so interesting to me. The sign said, you can have, you can have two of the following, right? And it said, it said, fast, good, cheap. So if you want it fast and good, it's not going to be cheap. And if you want it good and cheap, it's not going to be fast. And that always stuck with me. Like, you're never going to get everything that you want. You can pick two of the three. And I come back to my copy photo paradigm when I'm feeling overwhelmed at the house and, you know, you've got multiple responsibilities as a father and a litigator. Uh, you've got responsibilities as a husband, a parent, and vacation planner. And when I start to feel overwhelmed, I come back to my copy photo example, and I tell my wife this. I say, listen, you can have two of the three. You can have me at home, quality time. Or you can have some stuff, or you can have no debt. However you define stuff. So if I'm at home, and you got stuff, then we're going to carry some debt. And if I'm at home, and there's no debt, you might not have a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> so you tell me how you want it to be. That's the same paradigm that I work with when I start talking about professionalism, when I start thinking about professionalism, when I start thinking about what I write to a client and what I say to a client and how I will be able to defend that later on, no matter how outrageous it seems. And I'm going to show you some of what I've written to clients, so you, you'll judge for yourself how outrageous you are. I shared office space with Matt Crosby and Stacey Levy, so they already know I tried a case with Deborah. Deborah and I 
the, the way we work the case is Deborah spoke to the client, I tried the case. After, after she saw how I spoke to him at the jail, I guess she figured, oh, it's probably best I talk to him so he doesn't explode during the trial. And I tried the case, and it worked out perfect, right? It worked out perfect. We got our not guilty on very serious charges. He was calm, and, and the jury found exactly what we wanted them to find. Um, so I worked the same, the same paradigm. Let me start with this, though. Let me start with, because the, the, the title of the course is Professionalism with, when Dealing with the Street Client. That's what I'm talking about. When they send the bar letters back saying, hey, you know, you're not acting professional, blah, blah, blah. I'm not dealing with bankers. I'm dealing with street cats. Street cats, that's who I'm dealing with. I'm not dealing with CEOs. We're dealing with a certain person with a certain mentality. And so I like to start with just that. The, back, the backdrop, rule 1.14, it's in your material, a client with diminished capacity. Now, it's really supposed to be dealing with, you know, folks that have been mentally retarded, but I think the definition fits for street cats because it says in rule 1.14, when a client's capacity to make adequately considered decisions in connection with representation is diminished, whether because of minority, mental impairment, or for some other reason, i.e. poor education, faulty socialization, and street mentality, the lawyer shall as far as reasonably possible maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client. That's the backdrop to dealing with clients that aren't really trying to hear what you're talking about uh, and trying to sell you ultimately on, on their uh, version of facts and what the jury has to believe in their version of facts. Um, street person, where did I get that from? Well, I got that from the second to last book I read. It wasn't on any type of uh, CD or anything. I like listening to books on tape. Uh, Elijah Anderson, Code of the Street. Elijah Anderson is a sociologist that teaches at the University of Pennsylvania and he uh, defines this, the, the decent person and the street person in his studies of what goes on in the inner city. He defines, this is his definition, he defines a decent family, from page seven of the book, in decent families there's almost always a real concern with and a certain amount of hope for the future. Probably the most meaningful description of the mission of the decent family as seen by members and outsiders alike, is to instill backbone and a sense of responsibilities in its younger members. In their efforts towards this goal, decent parents are much more able and willing than street-oriented ones to ally themselves with outside institutions such as schools and churches. They value hard work and self-reliance and are willing to sacrifice for their children. They, they harbor hopes for a better future for their children, if not for themselves. This is his definition of it. It's easy for me to talk about it in this context because in the context that, that Elijah Anderson talks, he talks as a sociologist in sociologist terms. Um, the street family, this is his definition. The so-called street parents, unlike decent ones, often show a lack of consideration for other people and have a rather superficial, self, superficial sense of family and community, superficial sense of family and community. Every criminal defense attorney, when they hear that word, should automatically think of, what's she to you? That's my fiance. A superficial sense of family and community. When did you propose? <laughs> I really did. When did you give her a ring? A uh, ring? What's that? That's not your fiance. A superficial sense of family and community. Status is everything when you're talking about the street cat. Strat status is everything. One way to campaign for status is to take the possession of others. Seemingly ordinary objects can become trophies with symbolic value that far exceeds their monetary worth. Material things fit easily into the pattern. Sneakers, Stacey Levy just been on trial for three weeks with that. Sneakers, a pistol, even somebody's girlfriend can become a trophy. In this often violent give and take, raising oneself up largely depends on putting someone else down. That's your attorney-client relationship. 
They're going to get their status by writing to the state bar and complaining about you. They're going to get their status by complaining about you to the judge when they get an opportunity to go in front of the judge. So we go back to our copy photo paradigm. Rule 1.4, communication. We all know the rule. You got to communicate with your client. Probably inform the client of any decision or circumstance with respect to which the client's informed consent is required by the rules. Reasonably consult with the client about means, about the means by which the client's objectives are to be accomplished. We understand that. Communicate with the client. That's simple. You get some information, the information is germane to representation, communicate with the client. That's easy. Maximum penalty, public reprimand if you don't do it. Rule 1.4. That's easy. My favorite rule. Rule 2.1. You already know it. Candor. In representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid, candid advice. Render candid advice. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Let me add this, this is Lawrence. In a language that he or she can understand. <laughs> it is not candid advice if they don't understand what you're talking about. Did you feel some trepidation when you saw the blue lights go on? <laughs> That's not candid. In representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice in a language that the client can understand. A lawyer should not be deterred from giving candid advice by the prospect that the advice will be, here's the word, unpalatable. <laughs> Fantastic. That's like they wrote it for me. Unpalatable. Yes. Rule 2.1. Advisor, I can deliver unpalatable advice. A lawyer should not be deterred from giving candid advice by the prospect the advice would be unpalatable to the, to the client. Maximum penalty, disbarment. So for me, that's the, that's the big one, candor. So here we got communication and candor, right? Go back to our copy photo paradigm. Specialist, and what's the now? Here the game begins. If you're communicating with your street client, rule 1.4, in an absolutely candid manner, 2.1, are you going to be professional? <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A, Lawrence Lewis, not possible. It's not possible if you use the definition of I'm going to, I'm going to give him some unpalatable advice and he's not going to feel good about it. You won't be professional. And so we move to another example. If you're communicating with your client, 1.4, and you're being professional, well, we don't want to hurt his feelings, we want to be a good leader, are you going to be candid? Absolutely not. What's the penalty for failure to be candid? What's the maximum penalty? Disbarment. What? <laughs> Disbarment. That's why I say they created happy hour for just that moment. There. You got to communicate and you're going to be professional, but you got to eat what you really want to say. That's why, that's why happy hour was created. If you're being professional and candid, then I suspect that you're not really going to be able to communicate with your client. Now, I have an example from the last book I read. I chased all around town trying to find this book here. It's called Hyena by Jude Angelini. It's called Rude Jude, and he's on Sirius Radio <coughs> Shade 45, which is a channel I think that was created either by or for Eminem. It's, it's, it's rude. It's raw. Um, and I'm just going to read your next excerpt. I had to edit the excerpt because it was even a little bit too, little bit too raw for me. <laughs> so I had to edit it. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of it because it, 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 for me, gives you some insight into, he's got his own show, but he is willing to admit he's got a street mentality. And very rarely are you going to get somebody with a street mentality, what you call it, whether, it, whether it's thuggish or not, a street mentality who's bright enough to write and get published. I'm going to give you a little bit of it. So he writes, I'm driving to work down Pico, checking out a Mexican chick, walking Baby in hand, one in a stroller, a tamale away from being overweight, butt swinging. Doesn't say butt, but butt swinging. I'm listening to Willie Nelson in the car like my dad used to. He banged around town in the maroon Chevette, smoking cool, singing with singing along with Willie Nelson. You were always on my mind. I take a drag and blow it out. They put him in the loony bin around that time. Him and my mom were arguing, phone rings. It's the it's the guy she's seeing. She takes the call. Pot goes bananas, he's hollering, breaking stuff. Cuts his hand open on a busted jar, it's long and deep, he's 
bleeding everywhere, drives himself and drives himself to the hospital for stitches, and they admit him. I'm on the porch sharpening popsicle sticks, staring at my dad's blood on the concrete as he rushes off. Days go by, and I ask my mom where my dad is. He's sick. He's not feeling well. We go to the hospital to see him. We're outside the visiting area by the pull-up bars with the wood chips. He's sitting at the picnic table, somber. It looks like a man who just lost. He told us about the rape years later when I was 10 or 11. We were going to my nanny's in the Buick and he laid it on us. This is his father telling me about how the father raped the mother when the person here right here is still a small child. Rachel and I were playing in the bathtub when it happened. They were still married, but she wouldn't have sex with him anymore. She wanted, she wanted, she said she wanted to be faithful to Daryl. That's the new boyfriend. So he put a knife to her throat and raped her. He said he did it for love, said the knife wasn't that big, said he was drinking and drugging, said he got crazy when she started seeing the other guy just broke his head. He said he lost it. Well, that cleared things up. That's why mom showed up to Nani's that day trying to take us from him. That's why grandpa slapped him in the face, and that's why she wouldn't let him in the house anymore, and he'd always try to come anyway. Knife wasn't that big, he said. It was more symbolic. The very next breath, he'd say, look at this. We're alone. She did this to us. She broke up our family. Y'all, all I got left, all we got is each other. We gotta be good to each other. And he clutched the steering wheel, sobbing, and we nod and comfort him. And when I was back in the car with my mom, I'd say, Mom, why did you break up our family? Dad joined AA to get her back, and he was, he said, said, said it was the alcohol that made him act that way. It didn't work, he just ended up having sex with the rehab chicks. <laughs> no one was buying it anyway. It takes commitment to be a drunk, and he laughs at that. He's no drunk, he's just crazy. He'd get mad when my mom's people wouldn't invite him to Christmas every year. It was the same thing. Oh, that broke kid Daryl was invited. Why not me? He's not in the family. Your own father isn't welcome. That's BS. That's BS. That really hurts. You're going to let them do this to your own father? You're not going to stick up for me? So years later, we were like, well, goddamn, of course Daryl is invited. He didn't rape mom. That's the story. That's the mentality. You're not dealing with bankers. This is the mentality of the person when you're doing criminal work that you deal with at 2900 University Parkway. And here, there's a long story, till years later, finally, that's how I read it, see everybody reads it differently, till years later, finally, when we stopped being professional with him, and we started being candid with him, well, goddamn, of course Daryl is invited, he didn't rape mom. So the question for you, when you're a lawyer and you're at the jail and you hear the client say that the first time, yeah, I raped her, but the knife wasn't that big, it was more symbolic. Okay, you eat that the first time. Maybe it's the shock of you hearing it for the first time. You eat it. Do you say nothing when he says it the second time? You still reticent? The second time, the third time, the fourth time. Do you call that professionalism? Because I'm not really going to take it the second time. <clears throat> Don't say that anymore. You thinking that the knife wasn't that big, that mentality is not going to help us at jury trial. That mentality is not going to help us when we have to go and talk to the prosecutor about working out a deal. You need to hold that to yourself. You need to keep that on the inside. Like I tell the 12 year old, he says, I don't really want to do the work. Keep that to yourself. There's a lot of things I don't want to do either. I don't need to address it. Just say it to yourself. Are you going to, in that situation, be candid? or be professional, especially if you're going to communicate with them. Here's my position. I don't believe that you can be professional and candid in the same breath in 2014, 2015. I think in the past you used to be able to, but I don't think in 2014, 2015 you can be professional and candid. And this is why. I call it a Facebook culture mentality. And I'll give you an example. I was in Fulton County about eight or nine years ago, right? Uh, it was a few weeks after Christmas, and a lawyer who remained nameless, he and I lived on the same block at the time, he was describing to uh, a bunch of other lawyers what had transpired in the neighborhood. Uh, remember, it was shortly after Christmas, and right before Christmas, we had gotten like a little like a little block function together where, where six or seven neighbors got together. We had drinks at one person's house, and then we went to another person's house and had hors d'oeuvres, and then we went to another person's house 
and had dessert. That's the story. Well, I, eight or nine years ago, now this is, in my mind, this is before really the big Facebook, Facebook craze. I'm sitting in the jury room in Fulton County, and I'm sure we're doing some type of pretrial with the prosecutor, and he's describing this, the lawyer is, a friend of mine. And, and he's describing it, and I'm like, man, I wish I was there. I wish I was there at that. <laughs> I was there. I was there. I could barely recognize that what he was talking about is what I actually attended. Oh, I didn't have a good time. I had a good time. I didn't have the time that he was describing that everybody was having, but I had a good time. He had the gift of creating that sort of Facebook envy for what is not really envious. He had that gift way back eight, nine years ago for describing it. And, and, and I'm trying to get it, but it's hard. It's hard when I'm on a baseball field and it's hot and it's dirty, you know. It's hard for me to, to take a picture and create that. Listen, having a great time in baseball. Alice is going three for four. You should have seen it. It's hot, I'm hot, I'm hungry, we just surviving it. Are you kidding me? That mentality, that, that, that characterizing everything in a way where other people read it and wish they were there, wish they had participated in it, I think that that is ultimately what is going to drive uh, the definition of professional. This fanciful, happy storyline uh, that embodies professionalism, but I actually abhors candor. And I'll go with an example for you. I was appointed, Peter Magoo, I was appointed on a case back in August, August 14th of 2007. The client was charged with August 7, 2007. He was charged with three counts of rape, three counts of incest, three counts of child molestation, and sexual exploitation of children. That's what he was charged with. I represented the client really for only 90 days. And, and I wrote, I visited him a number of times. I had probably two meetings with the family. And, and I had, I wrote him about eight letters. He eventually complains to the bar and, uh, and, uh, and I'm replaced. And, and we'll tell you ultimately what happens in the case uh, after I read the letters. Um, but, but, but he complained after 90 days and eight letters. And, and when the bar wrote to me to have me explain what it is that I had or hadn't done on this case, this is this actual letter, November 27, 2007. This is how my first paragraph to the bar starts. I can't write this today. I can't write this today because I know it would be considered unprofessional today. But I wrote it and it didn't even, it didn't even there were no ripples, there were no waves. This is, this is what it, it reads. Dear Ms. Ra Raptor, it was Carmen Rojas Raptor at the time, November 27, 2007. It says, Dear Ms. Raptor, I received your correspondence regarding the grievance filed against me by Peter Magoo. I will try and address most of his complaints in an intelligent manner. However, I feel compelled to ask, is there an award for the attorney who has the most unfounded complaints in one year? <laughs> if there is, I would like to put my name in for consideration. Now, I consider that funny. I'm not getting paid for this in the first place. I wouldn't consider it to be unprofessional, and I think in 07 it wasn't unprofessional. But I, I know that if I put that in a, in a letter now, to the state bar in response to a grievance, I'm going to have a problem, and I'll show you why, because I recently uh, received a letter back. I wrote <laughs> <laughs> August 13th, August 13th, 2007, I wrote a letter to Peter Magoo. It starts off pursuant to our conversation on August 7th, 07. I decided to provide you with some legal research, search hope, to hopefully answer some of your questions. That was a two-page letter the next day. I wrote them again. Uh, wrote them, second line, this is the first time I've ever seen an entire family rally behind a client that has admitted in a recorded interview the sexual assault of a nine-year-old, but there's a first time for everything. That was August 14th. <laughs> August 15th. August 15th, next day. First and foremost, the investigator will come out to the jail in order to take a photo of your erect penis. While it seems crazy to me to uh, dispute that it's your penis in the computer photos because you signed the photos, I will pursue your defense 
like I have no idea what the law requires. That was my third, August, August 15th. A month later is when I wrote this letter to him. It's probably towards the end of our relationship. I think I might, this might have been letter number seven, either seven or eight. And it is one, two, three, four, five, five. It is, it's six pages, single space. <laughs> September 16th, Peter McGoo. Now, this is the letter I know he sends to the bar because the bar sends me back a copy of the letter. Not a, not a word about professionalism. Maybe they didn't read the letter. Not a word about professionalism when they send this letter back to me. And this is, this is the most dramatic part. Um, page four of the letter, I think it is. You don't have to remind me of anything. I think you were a complete idiot to have Susie go and speak to Crystal in light of the fact that you admitted to taking the photos with your penis inside of Crystal, who at the time was nine, put the penis in, took pictures, signed it. Uh, how are you gonna explain signing the photos? Did the rest of the interview, when you were laughing and talking calmly, here's your best defense, insanity. <laughs> I suggest you start to eat your own feces in order to prepare for an insanity defense. That's your only real possibility. That would have been a lesson. <laughs> that was the compelling reason I think Judge Ray removed me from it. <laughs> but before he removed me from the case, he asked me, did you write that? I'm like, yeah, I wrote that. Because he kept pressing me on, what's my defense? What's my defense? And that's the only defense I could see. He had a little chuckle out of me. You see, he really didn't want to laugh. But he kind of <laughs> the letter goes on. You are truly retarded. <laughs> when you write that Crystal made no outcry before you reported, reported her to her mother, what does that have to do with anything? Did Crystal make the photos with her boyfriend? Is not trying, is not trying to frame you? No. Because you signed a photo saying it was your penis. Further on in the letter, I will not ask the prosecutor for time, sir, because that's as stupid as asking a prosecutor if you can have sex with him. <laughs> you will eat the 25 year sentence or you will have a jury trial. What? This right here sometimes makes me blush. <laughs> oh, seven, this wasn't a problem. This is a problem now in 2014. This is a problem. What happened to Mr. Magoo's case, anybody? What happened? Played the 25 years. Just like I said he would. He had another attorney at the time, but it was candor. He played for the 25 years. Taiwan Davis, he's recently complained to me to the bar. And I haven't had a few, lot of complaints to the bar. It's, it's, it's sort of interesting. They stopped. He was probably one complaint that I had to the bar maybe in the last three years. I used to run about 10 a year. They were all unfounded. But I was running about 10 a year, and they just sort of dried up. I don't, I don't you know, maybe, maybe people are calling their girlfriends, getting the comfort and cheerleading they need from the girlfriend, the fiance. <laughs> the fiance. But they really are, you know, I don't have to deal with a whole lot of foreign complaints. Anyway, I was appointed on Mr. Taiwan Davis back on October the 10th, 2013, and I represented him for about 11 months when the bar complaint came. His charges are armed robbery, kidnapping, and aggravated assault. The offer that came in January of 2014 was life in prison as a non-recidivist. So he's facing life. And either we're gonna win and he's gonna go home or he's gonna go to trial and he's gonna face uh, life without parole because uh, he's got some prior stuff going on. Anyway, September 11, 2014, maybe that's September 11, 2014, maybe that's uh, ominous right there. The letter I received from the State Bar of Georgia, it reads, and this is how when Pam says, what topic you want to teach, I'm like, I'm going to teach professionalism. I'm going to teach professionalism. It says, the Office of General Counsel of the State Bar of Georgia has completed this review of the grievance filed against you by Taiwan Davis. The information furnished was not sufficient to prove any violation of the State Bar of Georgia ethics rules on your part. Therefore, the grievance was dismissed. Wait, wait. Although the grievance was dismissed, we would like to address Mr. Davis's concern regarding the tone and professionalism of your correspondence, specifically the letter dated June 16, 2014. While our office has no information regarding the circumstances that led to the writing of this letter, we believe the tone is inconsistent with the high standards that we as attorneys hold ourselves to when communicating with the public that we serve. The State Bar of Georgia appreciates your adherence to this request. Okay, so now knowing that I told another client 
to eat his own. This, this letter got to be like, this letter got to be off the chain, and I can do this. I read, I read it like 10 times, and I'm still looking for it. I read it. Here it is. Now, here it is. Here it is. June 16th, Mr. Davis. It only took me about 12 years if you cannot find the facts of the case or the witnesses or the judge or the prosecutor who made the life sentence offer, then fire the attorney. I do not take any of that personally. Absolutely nothing has changed in your case since we last communicated. I suspect that nothing will change in your case before we begin to pick a jury. The prosecutors offered you a life sentence because they think you admit us to society with few redeemable qualities. <laughs> you never intend to take that off of life in prison, which means 30 years before you're eligible for parole, so you will have a jury trial. I'll be out to see you about 10 days before your actual jury trial begins, if I am still the attorney. So you can see your interview with your girl and your girlfriend's interview. Now, this is June 16th. This is months before the bar complaint, but I can already feel it coming. Because he's not happy because he's in jail. And of course, I'm the one to blame because the prosecutor and the judge, they all want to free him, but I'm the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> the letter continues. In your interview, <clears throat> you callously admit to being a thief and committing ID fraud. You admit to possessing a firearm while on parole. You admit to recently ingesting cocaine, none of which places you in a redeeming light. In your girlfriend's interview, Alexis explains that you have no job no place to reside. She explains that you sleep in her vehicle because her folks do not allow you in the house because they are aware of your criminal record. In regards to these specific charges, she explained that when you and her stayed in a hotel room, you would leave after she goes to sleep and would return with a wad of cash, this is her language, or the type of wad where you know the person is either selling drugs or stealing from people. She also explained that you would insist that she not ask any questions about the money. Clearly, you will not be retaining an attorney. Your mother has told me a few months ago she will not be retaining an attorney. So if the judge sees the request for a new appointed attorney for what it is, i.e. a gain, a delayed tactic, etc., you will probably not be getting a new appointed attorney at taxpayer's expense. Either way, you need to begin to write down what you intend to present as your defense. If there are any questions, please feel free to contact me. I, listen, I included the letter in the packet because I'm reading it over and over and over. What, what part? It can't be the part about his interview because that's factual. The girlfriend's interview is factual. You won't be retaining an attorney. I spoke to your mother. Uh, so if the judge sees a request for a new court appointed attorney for what it is, a game, a delay tactic, that's what it is. Everybody in here that's, that, that has handled more than 50 major felony cases knows it's a game or delay tactic. So I guess we go back to the first paragraph again. It only took me about 12 years to understand what's going on in clients' heads. If you can't fire the facts of the case or the witnesses or the judge or the prosecutor that, that made the right sentence offer, then fire the defense attorney. Is that unprofessional? State Bar says it was. I got a letter here. <laughs> I got a letter. And it says, although the grievance was dismissed, we would like to address this letter. You put it together. That's why I included it. I included what I consider to be a crazy letter from 07. A crazy letter from 07. And a letter from 2014. And those are worlds, worlds apart. And I think they provide evidence of basically my position, which says uh, it's very difficult, I argue impossible, for you to be candid when you are representing a client, communicating with that client, and then still being viewed as professional when, uh, when, you're, dealing with, um, when you're dealing with the state bar or another group of attorneys who aren't as experienced, who don't understand the code of the streets. I'm going to take some questions. We got mm, probably about five or ten minutes. Uh, we may okay, good. Minute. Minute. Okay, it's fantastic. The, 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 um, <coughs> Ms. Britt asked if I would deal with the issue of how people are going to collect money. And I'm thinking collect money in the context of cats that really don't want to give you money. Okay, all right, yeah, I can deal with that. So, so we'll deal with a little bit of that. The question I think came out, 
how did it come out? Uh, how do I collect my, let's, let's just call it, how do I collect my money? Um, this, is, this is my rules. You can adopt the rules or not adopt the rules. Uh, rule number one, I think this is material. Collect the bulk of your money up front. Collect the bulk of your money up front. If you want 3500 and they say, how much do I have to give you down? Yeah, you may want to put them on a payment plan because you, know, you don't want that client to walk out the door and not retain you. You may say 2500 Collect the bulk of that money. Well, I only got 15. Well, when you put the other thousand of that dollars together, come back and do it. Here's, here's my rule also. Uh, and it comes with experience. And you gotta listen very closely when the client is talking. If the client uses these words, my price automatically doubles. What's the magic words? Just only little, my price doubles. When they're talking to me, I got this little problem. Yeah. Okay, the price is going to double. I only need you to, the price is going to double. If you just file, the price is going to double. Because my experience is that person's not really going to pay you your money. They don't really value what you're doing. They know they need a lawyer, but they feel sort of like, like pulled into it. And they don't intend to pay you all year. That's my experience after 15 years. So as soon as I hear those words, only just little. Now, the folks in here that's been here 10, 12, 15 years, they're like, yeah, that's right. Would they? And, and they stiff me on that. That's my rule. Collect the bulk of your money up front. If the case is about to close, let's say you, you wanted 3,500, they gave you 2,500, you've spoken to the prosecutor, and, and uh, you're able to get the case played out uh, next week or in two weeks. If the case is about to close, close it. Call it bad debt if you want to, but keep the goodwill that you have for the client. You wanted 35, you got 25. You close the case out after two weeks, you want about the last thousand. This is my assistant show. Look, they owe us another $500. Are you, are you for real? How long did we work on the case? Take the total amount that you collected, divide it by the number of hours. If you made over $500 an hour, what are you talking about? You know that's not your billable rate. Who cares about the last $1,000? What's the rule on bad debt? What's the rule on bad debt? Macy's, uh, Target, Walmart, they all extend credit. What's their rule on bad debt? You know, some of the people that extend credit to are never going to give them, never going to repay that money. That's called bad debt. What's the rule on bad debt? Zero, do you think Walmart has zero bad debt? No. What do you think it is? 1%, 2%? You gotta understand it. It's gonna run six or 7%. What's that mean? If it's zero, if it's zero, it means you're not extending enough credit. That means there's an extra one or two million dollars in credit that you could extend that 94% that of it would be paid back. Well, you don't want to have, you don't want to lose out on the credit that you could extend, worrying about the few people that are not going to pay, and you're going to carry some bad debt. You're a business. Most of your entrepreneurs, you're a business. You're going to have some bad debt. Carry the bad debt. Hold on to the $500 they owe you. Hold on to the $750 they owe you. I, I got it right there. If you did good work and you handled it quickly, and they're mature, they will write your check and you will be paid. It happens, eh, maybe only 50% of the time, but it happens. <laughs> and here's my other rule. If they don't straighten up, they coming back. <laughs> and when they come back, I need that money and I need all the rest of it. You already know I can produce, that's not an issue. I need all my money, because you're not doing it on a payment plan. We've already seen that. And that's not something they can argue with again. Listen, you talking about maybe in a 15 year period, I've had $20,000 of bad debt, $22,000 worth of bad debt. You can't build a business around not having bad debt. You build a business around getting the client in, doing the service, and collecting your money. <clears throat> if the case is not about to close, you wanted $6,500, they came and bought $4,500, they gave you another two fifty, dollars and, and, and you got the discovery, you've gone through the discovery, you already know it's going to be another three or four or five months. Withdraw! Withdraw! That's it. Uh, just withdraw. They clearly are going to pay you, so withdraw. 
Sometimes when you withdraw, half the time, they come back and pay you the rest of the money. It's cheaper to pay you than to go try to find another lawyer. Withdraw. It's real simple. The trick with withdrawing is you don't want to do it more than two or three times a year. Why? Because you don't want to be that lawyer where the judge asks this question. Are you really in it? Are you in it all the way? Are you all the way in it? You don't want to have that reputation of being the lawyer that's in it for the premium or in it for the bond motion, but you're not really all the way in because you got 52 withdrawals for the year. You don't want that reputation. So it's a fine balance. But if in fact, if in fact you have, you put them on a payment plan and it's close to closing and you looking at what they paid you divided by the number of hours you spent and you should know that and it's some outrageous rate. Oh, it's $900 an hour. Are you kidding me? But you need the other 750? Stop playing. Close the case. If it's not about to close, then you fall. <clears throat> Always be familiar with that. Your reputation from withdrawing from cases in a jurisdiction where you frequently appear. That's really the rule. If you're in Hall County and you never really go to Hall County and you got to withdraw, who cares? If you got to go back to Hall County in another case, you got to withdraw, who cares? You know, if the bulk of your cases are in Gwinnett, who cares? Because you're only going up to Hall County. You really can't have a reputation for withdrawing from Hall County when you've only handled two cases there in the last 18 months. But if you, if the bulk of your cases are here in Gwinnett and you've withdrawn in the last 18 months on 40 cases, your reputation is going to be a little bit sully that you really don't want to run into that reputation ultimately over money. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just want to add something to that because this ties into what I'm doing next, which is ineffective. This is Sharon Hopkins, uh, who does a number of appeals. She's the person, she's my favorite person. <laughs> like probably, she, she's probably my favorite lawyer because she's not afraid to say, you did this wrong at the trial, and you did this wrong, and you did, and I'm like, I, did, I thought it was great! <laughs> she's like, and you did this wrong, and you messed this up, and you messed that up. Were you drunk? I'm like, oh my. That's my favorite person. Because everybody else is just like, oh, you did a great job. She's the only person that's willing to tear my work apart. <laughs> Sharon Hopkins. Go ahead. I will say on TV where you know that you have a fee for a client and they don't pay you on the plan and they keep hoping and then they try to withdraw just before the trial. And you don't have money for your experts that you were hoping to have. You weren't have hope having money for the things you're gonna do and I'm finally ineffective with attorneys who look at me and say, of course I didn't do any work. They didn't pay me. And I'm That's like, I'm sorry. You're their attorney. Either get out in a timely manner and let somebody else pick it up or get your money up front and then you don't have to worry about it. But, I, you know, that one bugs me in particular. I will come <laughs> after people who say, I did a crappy job because I got paid crappy. What about uh, not hiring experts, though? That, 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 that's now Stacey Levy. What's the question, Stacey Levy? I just asked about what about if you don't get an expert because they didn't pay you for, to get an expert. What's your position? I, I think sometimes you, you have to build that into the, I mean, if, particularly in cases where expert is critical, like a, a medical expert or a, or a child expert, that's got to go into the fee from the get-go, or maybe you know you're in a jurisdiction where the family's paid you, but the client qualifies for indigent defense, and you might be able to get an expert under the indigent program there's some good case law that says, even though some of the judges say, you know, if you're retained, you're retained and you're injured, you're injured, there's some great case law that says, no, the family's money is not his money, and he's still entitled to certain things as he's indigent. If you can do that in the jurisdiction, great. If you can't, you, you're hurting your client because the public defender might be able to get those experts. So, so, so here's, here's what the rule might be for the younger attorneys in the room. If you're retained on a case by the client and the client's out of money, it may be time to tell the judge, listen judge, I have to withdraw and you can appoint me and then ask for expert funds. If the family has retained you, it might be time for you to say, judge, I need to withdraw and I need you to appoint me and I need to have expert, I need to have expert funds. That, that may be ultimately what you have to do in that situation. But in no way, shape, or form can you ever be deemed a professional by saying, um, I, needed, I needed 20 more hours, or I needed 20,000 more dollars to hire experts, and I didn't have any of that, so I just threw it up. 
that's never going to fly. That should never fly. That's never going to fly. So you've got to figure out, really it's about timing. Stay on the top of your case. It's, it's easy for lawyers to say, get your money up front. What? That's like the goal. Okay, just pay. Listen, what's your fee? 6500 Okay. I need mean, all of it now. Otherwise, I can't represent you. That sounds great. But if they got $4,500 in their pocket and you're letting them walk out the door, um, you're going to lose a lot of clients because somebody's going to take that $4,500 and put it on a payment plan. And they, they, I'm going to take the $4,500 and put them on a payment plan for the rest of it because I know I, I have an idea of how long it's going to take. And if it's close to closing, I'm going to close it. And if it's not close to closing, or if I think it's going to actually be a trial, then we're talking about something different. Whether or not I might do a, a, a jury trial versus a bench trial where a client says, and we talk about this all the time, if I think it's a case that's very winnable but the client doesn't have any money and we can bench try it in four hours, I'm going to try the case. Well, he doesn't have any money. Are you for real? I'm going to try the case because if I think I can beat the case and I beat the case, yeah, he'll owe me a little $750, <coughs> whatever, whatever. He may pay me, he may not. But if it's not guilty, he's going to take the goodwill that I've created into the community when he refers other people to me. That's my favorite question when people call me. How did you get my number? So-and-so gave me your number. How did he like my results? He thought you was fantastic. So now all we gotta do is talk about my price now. Me selling is over. I'm not selling anymore now because you've already got it from a trusted source that I'm the truth. Now we need to talk about my money. That's it. So I'm good with a person going into the community. How, how much you plan paying for your marketing a year? This is this this how crazy it sounds to me. You're paying twenty thousand, twenty five thousand for marketing for for uh, search engine optimization and for advertising and for this and that. But you don't want to try a case and let the client go on his way for seven hundred and fifty dollars and put your good name in the community in a community of street people. <laughs> He's going to put your name back into the very community where your next five or six clients are going to come from anyway. There's no better advertising than that. And it costs you $750 if he doesn't pay you. If he pays you, it costs you nothing. So that's never a good reason for me. Uh, uh, ultimately, they're not going to try. He owes me $750, and I'm not going to try the case for, you know, because he hasn't paid me my money. I'm just going to try that case. I'm just going to try that case. Uh, it's almost five after. Any other yes. questions? Yes, sir. Very quickly for young lawyers. This is Mr. Ralph Unstein. Obviously, you evaluate the case before you set the fee. Do you net worth the client? Do I net worth them? Yes. What you mean? Net worth them. Bring the family in, look at the lady's ring. I don't, I don't. When they come, when they come in, obviously I'll look at what they're driving, but I don't bring everybody in. I have an idea of what the case is going to, of how many hours the case is going to take, and I have an idea of of the prosecutor and the judge and who I can work with and what I may be able to work out. And I'm more interested in, is this client gonna keep blowing up my phone? You understand? So it, like, it, it, it's not worth it to me. If I can get 5,000 out the client, for example, and I only charge him 3,500, it's not worth it to me to get the five from him if he's gonna be calling my office 100 times aggravating my staff. Because then they're gonna aggravate me and I don't get to go home a la Ray Rice and aggravate my wife. So, so, so I gotta eat that, you see, I gotta eat that. And I really don't want home is stressful enough and then I got folks stressing at work and then you know, I can't get to play with so much tennis. Well, are you kidding me? So I don't need the stress of that client. I, I'm measuring, client. listen, I, I send clients to other people. I said, when I call you and say I got a client, it's a headache client. <laughs> you might need some money, but I'm telling you it's a headache client because I don't want them. You watch what they're driving? I do look at what they're driving. And when that brand new paid for Cadillac comes into your office lot, you don't get a I don't know if it's paid assignment. for. It's Georgia. It's what Georgia. I know that? bankruptcy rates in Georgia. I know for a mortgage fraud in Georgia. I don't know who paid for that. I don't know what girl he had to schmooze. His Mac game may be real. His Lawrence is so his, his Mac game, his to get Mac game might be very all right title and interest in and to, and if it's not paid in ninety days, that security interest becomes yours. I, I don't, don't know what the tax consequences are of a used car. I, I I do not. Well, there. I do not. Now I, I don't. I can't tell you what Mr. Hunstein is suggesting to you is that you can always get your money if you are willing to file liens. 
if you're willing to file five phase, if you're willing to take other things in lieu of cash payments. Hunts, I can't tell you, Mr. Hunstein's way is incorrect, it's, it's not good for me, because all I want to do is practice law. I don't want to practice collections. I don't want to play that game. I'm just telling you me, the same way I don't drink, I don't want to do collections. Now, I, I, I probably could get that 22 or 25,000 that's owed to me. Um, there there are, is no collection when you already own it. Well, by an assignment of all right title and interest. You still got to sell it. <laughs> well, you have to sell it. You got to list it. There, there, there are other things going on. And you also have the, the, the bar. And we've already read the letter. I read the letter, right? I read the letter. You may be able to figure out why I was unprofessional. If that person said they were somehow tricked by Mr. Hunstein into signing over that car, you got to go down there and deal with them. So I don't know that it's your car until the state bar, if they complain, says it's your car. I don't know. I don't know. Well, Mr. Hunstein, again, Mr. Hunstein's a little older. He's a little older. And, and he might be thinking it's still 07, but I've already shown you. There's a difference between 07 and 014. It's a little bit different. What he, what he may have done for 20 years, which may be perfectly legal, there may be people in the state bar of Georgia now that say, I don't like it. And so, I don't care. Oh, oh, well, well, that, 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 that sounds good for the older attorneys that might be on, on the back nine. For the young attorneys, you on the back nine. You on the back, I'm going to tell you, you on the back nine. Okay, guys, we, we need to move on. Lawrence will be around if you guys need to talk to him. I will. Uh, but thank you.